Hello, this is Rebecca Gill, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. On this webinar, I have a special guest, which is a very good friend of mine, Carrie Dills. I brought her on because I really wanted to talk about how accessibility matters with SEO and what you can do as either developers or website owners to make sure that you are putting your website or blogs best foot forward with accessibility and in an effort to not just reach SEO, but also really connect to the humans that are visiting your website or blog. Um, it is super important to today's SEO and it's growing in importance. I will admit that a few years ago, I did not even think about accessibility. And now I look back at those days and I feel really, really bad about it because, you know, as an agency owner who does development and as an SEO consultant and as just a stinking good human being, accessibility should have been on my radar much more than it, than it was at that time. Um, I am very acknowledged or very um, focused now on accessibility, and it is definitely something that I make sure that is included in every single website audit I do. It's something that we um, look for and check on all of our um, custom work that we do, and it's something that I encourage my SEO clients to pay special attention to because it matters. Um, Google is pushing more and more information out on accessibility, and they're telling us that it is super important. Um, and it, it's just because Google is beginning to really push accessibility, we know it's going to continue to grow in importance. Um, if it is not part of today's current algorithm, it will be a part of tomorrow's algorithm. And I've learned this with Google over the last 15 years. When you start to see the Google team push information forward, you know it is coming and it is going to be part of the um, factors that are going to decide whether or not your content is going to rank in search. So, you know, from, from first and foremost, again, it is important to humans so you can connect with your visitors. Um, secondly, it's really important to Google and it's growing into importance with Google. And it, they will be utilizing this to decide how your content's gonna rank in search. But then the third thing about that, which a lot of people don't realize is Google is a machine. And in many ways, it is also um, hampered and it has its own accessibility issues. So whenever you are doing things for accessibility, you are actually helping Google better understand your website, your blog, and your content, and how that content might be used to serve somebody's question in search. And as Carrie goes through her presentation today, and we go through the Q&A, I want you to keep that in mind. I really want you to think about, um, you know, what she's talking about, how it relates to your website or your blog, and then always keep in mind that what you're doing for that human, you're also doing for the search engines and you're giving the search engines a much better idea of you know, what you offer and who you can help with this information that you're providing. Uh, so just a few housekeeping um, things before I hand over controls to Carrie. Um, first of all, there is a questions option in the GoToWebinar box that's available for you. We will use that. I will be collecting those questions as Carrie goes through her slides. If anything comes to your mind that you want to ask questions about, throw it in there because we are going to leave time at the end of the presentation for Carrie to go through those questions. And we'll try to hit as many as we can um, before we have to wrap up the webinar. Um, if we don't cover all of your questions, I will make sure that I get those out in a blog post or you know an email or something to get that communicated to everybody because I want to do, I do want to make sure that we cover everything that's asked. Um, the presentation slides themselves are available in the handout. Um, so they are, they're there as well. And um, feel free to grab those at any time. They're also on my SlideShare account. Um, and then at the end of this webinar, we will be sending out a video recording of it, and I will post it up to my YouTube channel, which is where I put all of the past training materials that I've done with um, the free webinars and that type of activity. Um, and then one last housekeeping point, if Carrie is doing a demonstration or you're having trouble seeing anything in the slides, just pop in a note on the questions and I'll make sure that I'm watching that and I do a little scream out to her so that she knows to increase a font or you know, modify what she's doing. I mean, we want this webinar to be as accessible to you as it is the information that you're taking away to work with your clients or your visitors to your website. 
Okay, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Carrie. Carrie, people know about me. I've been doing this for a while. Um, this is the first time I've had you come on to a webinar, so if you could just give people a little bit of an idea of who you are, where you've come from, that would be great. Sure, thanks Rebecca, first off, for having me on, and uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. I'm thrilled that you're interested in learning more about accessibility. Uh, I Accessibility came onto my radar oh, four or five years ago. Um, I'm a front-end web developer with most of my uh, experience in the WordPress world, uh, and it was at a WordPress conference where I heard someone speaking on accessibility, and um, that was the first time I ever really, I guess, thought about it or thought about it being a thing. Uh, and since that time, I've kind of dug in and tried to learn more and incorporate what I've learned uh, both across my own web properties and helping to educate others and uh, spread spread the message, if you will. Um, so before we actually dive into the, the slides, under the title here, Optimizing Your Website for Accessibility, you'll notice that hashtag ally or A11Y. And that is shorthand for accessibility. Uh, there are 11 letters between the A and the Y. So that's why you've got the A, the 11, and the Y. Just a little fun, uh, well, nerd nerd fun uh, bit of information for you. So if you walk away with nothing else um, from this webinar, and I don't want you to like hang up as soon as I say this, but these are the two things I want you to know. Uh, one is what Rebecca was just talking about, and that is, if it's good for accessibility, it is good for your website's SEO. Um, and then the second one is, I'm gonna throw a lot of information at you today. Uh, accessibility is a broad topic uh, with lots of different types of applications, and what I want you to take away is that any effort you make towards accessibility is a step in the right direction. Uh, so don't feel like you have to go tackle it at all uh, immediately. So we're talking about accessibility. Um, what exactly is it? Um, the Wikipedia here, web accessibility is basically making your web content inclusive, um, making it available to people. Um, if, you, if, if any of you are familiar with the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, the, the nineties, that was basically saying that if you've got a building, it needs to be wheelchair accessible. Um, your doors have to be a certain width. You need ramps, that sort of thing. Think of that as accessibility is just the web version of that. Um, and accessibility isn't just for people with disabilities. Uh, there are a lot of people, especially uh, if you're a developer and listening to this, think about how many times you never even touch your mouse. You're just navigating with your keyboard. Um, and keystrokes. So there's some of it that's preferential in terms of how people interact with the web or consume content. And accessibility is just a set of practices that we can do to make whatever it is that we publish on the web as broadly accessible as possible. So that's accessibility. But what is good accessibility? I'm so glad you asked. There are four kind of basic principles of accessibility and handily enough, they spell out the letters POUR, P-O-U-R. Uh, the first is gonna be perceivable. The second, operable. The third, understandable, and then robust. So you may be saying, what the heck? Uh, so let's take a look at each of those and then I'll give you some examples of what, what that looks like. <clears throat> so the first is perceivable. And this is sort of, I guess, maybe the most capped and obvious thing of accessibility. Uh, so if people are going to be able to perceive or consume web content, they have to be able to get that information from the web into their brain uh, so that they can process it. And if they can't get the information there, well, it's not accessible. So what are some examples of that? In coding terms, remove the titles from your links. So in the, the bad example there, we've got a, a um, an A tag and we're using the title contact us. Uh, now, if you're using an assistive technology, like a screen reader, that's basically just going through and reading the code, uh, or excuse me, reading the, uh, the output on a web page, then your screen reader would say, contact us, contact us. And it's just duplicate information 
It's not needed. So whenever you're using links, just strip out the title completely. <clears throat> Another example would be meaningful alt text for images. Uh, in the past, like Black Hat SEO practices would be to use that alt tag to stuff all kinds of spammy keywords or whatnot. Uh, that's not what they're for. Um, they are there so that if your image doesn't display for some reason, there's meaningful text behind it, or if someone is visually impaired and can't see the image, they're able to still understand uh, the context of that photo. Um, typically, when you think about adding uh, alt text to images, it's just to images that have meaning on your page. For example, you wouldn't need to give alt text to a background image since that's decorative. Um, but best practice, name your images something good because Google does look at that. Uh, and then also make your, imagine, close your eyes, imagine you can't see and someone was describing what was in that picture to you and make that your alt text. Obviously don't get like ridiculous with the paragraph, but you get the idea. Uh, and then use form labels. So this is sort of a trend I've seen in web development. You want it cleaner, your forms to be cleaner. So you strip out the labels and maybe just put a placeholder in there. Um, well, you need the labels for accessibility. And I, I put in there a fake little class of hide this if you want. Uh, if you don't want the label to show visually, but still showing the code, then you can uh, hide that with CSS class. Okay, whoop, all right. So color blindness is another example of what perceivable web content is. Um, on the normal side here, I've just got link and red, green, and blue. And then you can see what that might look like with a couple of different uh, color blindness um, conditions. And I'm gonna say something that if you're a designer, you may hate me for saying this, but please use text underline, text, text link underlines. Um, you can use a, a bottom border if you don't want to do the text decoration of an underline. But imagine that for some reason, uh, like that very bottom right one, the can you spot the link where there there is no differentiation between the link text and the sentence text. Um, the underline is what makes that stand out and makes it perceivable. Color contrast. Um, it's kind of a no-brainer, but foreground and background color need to be uh, contrast enough so that text is easy to read. Uh, if you're getting older like me and you're whipping out your uh, your flashlight at a restaurant to look at the menu, and <laughs> imagine uh, how much more difficult that is if there's not good contrast between the foreground and the background. Um, and there are some actual specifications for what that ratio should be. Um, three to one ratio for large scale text and uh, four and a half to one ratio for other text. So color contrast, another bit of perceivable um, things you can do for perceivability. The next principle is operable. And <clears throat> I mentioned this earlier, but not everybody uses a standard uh, keyboard and mouse to operate the web. Some people are using assistive technologies uh, and then other people just their, their preference is not to use a mouse. Um, so what are some examples of what operable might look like in the real world? <clears throat> so a bad example would be moving or blinking content that can't be paused or stopped. Um, this kind of makes me think of like 1990s web design, uh, but you still see it from time to time. So if there are any controls, this is even true for music controls, like auto playing music, um, you need to give the user control over either pausing it or stopping it um, if they need to. Alerts, I'm sure this probably happened to you where you've been so annoyed that you're trying to consume an article and there's some alert that you cannot get rid of, it just hangs over. Uh, and covers up the content, and that's really annoying. Um, or let's say that an authentic, you're you're doing something, you're making a purchase, or you're going through a, a long questionnaire. You walk away from your computer, um, your session expires, and then when you re-log in, you have to start over from from zero. Um, 
that's an accessibility uh, issue that makes things not operable. Another one is uh, making all functionality available from the keyboard. So I'll show you an example of this later. Um, but using the, like, say you're using the tab button to move sequentially through navigation, uh, that's a great thing. But say you're using the tab button to move through like a form field, and all of a sudden your cursor focus jumps to some other spot on the screen. I'll show you an example of that in a second too. Um, and then skip links. Skip links are fantastic for accessibility. And basically what it is is letting the user um, from the keyboard skip to certain pieces of main content. So skip to the nav, skip to the... Uh, the main body, the sidebar, the footer, etc. Let me, Rebecca, this is going to be a little bit scary. Okay, so <laughs> if, if if everybody's keyboards and monitors blow up, we just know Carrie created the issue. It's me. Okay, I'm going to pause my screen real fast and see if I can flip over to do a little demo. Carrie's using multiple monitors, by the way, and it is causing slight challenges with GoToWebinar software. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, okay, I'm back. I'm, well, you there said you it's go. causing okay. issues. So we okay. see Utility Pro, you're good to go. Great, so I'm gonna show you an example of skip links uh, for starters, and I'll just put my cursor here. Can you see my cursor, Rebecca? Yep. Okay, I'm gonna put it there in the search box. Um, I'm tabbing backwards right now. Uh, whoops. Okay, so now I'm, I'm at the very start of the skip links. So imagine that you start, I would have started in my navigation bar, but then it would have tabbed through all these browser icons and I don't wanna make you suffer through that. Um, anyway, so they're just, let's say skip to content. Um, when I hit the enter key on that, it took me down to the main content of the page. So that's an example of skip links. And I've got a, when it's a second, I'll flip back and uh, share some resources with y'all that have uh, tutorials on how you can add this to your site. Uh, let me go back and put my uh, in the search box. And now I'm gonna tab forward. So just hitting the tab key and I'm gonna go through um, my navigation. So there you can see focus on feature, color options, and color options has a drop down menu. So you'll notice if I keep tabbing, it takes me sequentially down the list uh, and then on and on through the nav. Um, the idea here with tabbed navigation is that without touching a mouse, I should be able to access everything in the menu. Okay, I'm going to pause the screen, go back to my slides. I think I'm getting the hang of this. Okay, we're back. Yep. Um, so that would be an example of, of uh, operability. And then <laughs> this last one, this sounds ridiculous, but please don't cause seizures for people. And I didn't, I'm not showing you a live demo of this because I really don't want to give anybody seizures that's watching this webinar. Uh, but if you just want to have some fun, go to the world's worst website ever.com. And some of these elements on there, like where the stars are, those are flashing uh, swoopy doo things. And believe it or not, that can actually trigger seizures in people. So be careful with your cray cray animations. You know what? I didn't know that Cray Cray Animations was going to come out of my mouth in this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> but it did. Okay, so moving on. Uh, accessibility, um, it needs, content needs to be understandable. And this is sort of... I, I think this one's pretty obvious. Let me just show you some examples. Um, so use the language attribute button on... HTML and ignore the example there because that was not the right example. Um, give users enough time to read the content. 
Uh, and then lastly, there don't use carousels. This is another really fun website. Should I use a carousel.com? Um, don't uh, is the bottom line. It's not good for accessibility and studies show that users don't uh, consume that content. They don't click on it. Uh, some really interesting research out there or not. Clients love carousels because they're kind of sexy looking, but uh, try to talk them out of it if at all possible. Okay, robust. This makes me think of like robust red pasta sauce for some reason. Uh, but robust basically means that whatever the current web coding standards and guidelines are, uh, be up to date with that. Um, so validate your code, make sure it doesn't throw errors, uh, programmatically name your, your uh, components on the page, you know, like your navigation, forms, buttons, et cetera. Um, so if you move, or excuse me, if you use a validator, um, and let's see, I think there's a link at the bottom. Whoop. Okay, so there's a couple of links at the bottom there. And these are all, I think, live links. So if you're uh, looking at the slides on the PDF, you should be able to click right through. Um, so when you run your code through a validator, it should um, parse completely. If you're, and that that's more handy, those tools I listed at the bottom are more for if you've got a live website um, that you can kind of plug into one of those validators. If you're working on a local development machine, whatever, uh, code editor you're using, uh, PHP Storm or Sublime Text, Notepad++, whatever. Um, a lot of them have code linters that you can add to them so that you can lint your code. And linting is just a fancy name for validating uh, and cleaning up. You can do that right in your code editor. Oh, sorry, I had to take a sip of water. Um, we're gonna talk more about HTML5 in a little while, uh, but I also wanna introduce you to the uh, word ARIA, A-R-I-A. And that's just a way to provide extra information about the semantics of various elements. Uh, so that uh, if assistive technologies like screen readers are looking through your code, um, it knows what, uh, what something is what you've intended it to be. So for example, in HTML5, you've got a button element that you can use, which is obviously a button. <clears throat> in that case, um, a screen reader or Google would know that that's a button. So no need to declare an ARIA role there. Uh, but let's say that you were using a link and styling it like a button, or you wanted it to behave like a button, then you could give it an ARIA role of button. You can also use ARIA uh, for states like pressed or unpressed. Um, so when it comes to mobile development or touchscreen, uh, ARIA plays an important role there too. And there's a link at the bottom where you can learn more on that. Um, okay. So we're gonna do, talk a little bit about testing a website, but before I do that, let me run back to, uh, I'm gonna give you a seizure just doing all this. Okay, so when we talk about the principles of accessibility, um, there's actually a governing entity uh, that sets accessibility guidelines. Um, and again, we'll give links to all that. Um, there are three different standards. There's level A, there's double uh, A and triple A. Uh, the current standard, accepted standard is double A. Um, kind of moving forward, things will be moving into AAA. So when we talked about things like, um, oh, where do, okay, so no color contrast. So these ratios would be for uh, AA. If you wanted to strive for AAA uh, compliance, you would have to go to even a more extreme uh, contrast ratio. Okay, I meant to do a slide on that and I didn't, so. Sorry. Okay, and we're back. All right. So that's sort of an, in what accessibility is in a nutshell, what that might look like in a web context. So you might be saying, Carrie, how can I test my website? Well, I'm glad you asked. There are multiple, multiple options out there. Okay. 
The first, let me see if I can start this little video. Um, so the first, if you use Chrome for your development, you can use the Chrome developer tools and under your inspect tab, uh, the audits, or excuse me, under inspect panel audits, you can go and select accessibility, SEO as well, run an audit, and I'm running an audit here on uh, wordpress.org, and it's gonna come back and da -da 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 -da. it'll give you a score. Now, and it'll also give you a suggestion of things that you need to work on. It's not the most robust of accessibility testers, but this is a really great, easy place to start. Uh, doesn't cost any money. Um, oh, and hold on, look at this. Okay, can anybody look at this link to WordPress downloads? and tell me what's wrong. Well, I can't see your comments at this point. But if you said that link doesn't need a title, you would be correct. And especially, this is a download link and the title is Get It, Got It Good. That's absolutely meaningless and provides no extra context or help to a user. That's uh, It's just sort of cutesy, not meaning to call WordPress out, but just an example uh, in in the wild. So, uh, so the Chrome accessibility tool is a really good one uh, just to get started with. Um, next, sort of my favorite free tool is Wave, the web accessibility evaluation tool. You just slap a URL in there and it'll do an audit. And I was actually would love to audit someone's web page as an example. So, if you're feeling brave, throw your uh, URL up in the notes, and Rebecca, will you toss me one? I sure will. Anybody want to have Carrie pick apart your site live on a webinar? I mean, come on, who doesn't <laughs> want that to have happen? <laughs> oh, I'll pick. Yeah, it. I'll happily pick part by him. One from my buddy Gwen, who is awesome. So it is G as in George, M as in Mary. Give me are you, are you, one wait, sec. Yeah, you've got to flip over. Sorry, forgot about that. That's right. Okay, sorry, start over. Um, G is in George, M is in Mary, C is in Cat, C is in Cat, V is in Victor, T is in Tom, dot org. Dot org. And we are not seeing what you're auditing yet. We're seeing the slide share. Okay. Or the slides. Green Mountain okay. Children's Center. Am I on the right yes. website? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to copy that URL and I'm going to open up the Wave Web Aim Tester. This is Gwen's site? Yes. Well, not Gwen's site, but I think Gwen's client's site. Awesome. Well, thanks, Gwen, for uh, being a guinea pig. Uh, and she so, she put in the questions that this was not, with all caps, an accessible build. <laughs> Perfect. That just gives us things to look at. Yes. Um, so the way this this tool works, just to give you a quick little orientation, um, I'm going to refresh here because it doesn't look like the page is painting fully. Um, so it paints the page on the right with some markup. Oh, it's just way down there. Okay. Uh, and then on the left, it gives you some some information. Um, so errors or things we want to address, alerts or sort of like the, ah, this might be bad. Features is a nice way of saying, well done, this is great. Um, structural elements, the HTML5 and ARIA, like pretty much these are all great things. Um, contrast errors, alerts and regular errors, those are the bad news bears. So let's start by clicking on this little flag and that's gonna give us more information about what is wrong. Uh, so let's see, two times, if I hover over here, let's see, it will take me, okay, so we're looking at this Facebook uh, link down there, and it's just saying um, there's no alt text. So if we were to open up Inspector, and I'm not going to do that, but if we looked at that, um, it's just saying there's no alt text on the image. Um, so an example of alt text for these, since these are two separate Facebook pages, uh, you could say Facebook page for GMCC Hartford, 
And this other one could be Facebook page for GMCC Claremont. Um, missing form labels. Let's see, where's, where's my form? I feel like it's hiding from me. Okay, but we talked about form labels, their importance, they need to be here. Um, some orphan form labels. And on any of these, if you click this little eye, it, it brings up um, what explains what the problem is and then gives you some references to what those uh, accessibility guidelines are, um, why it's actually throwing that error. Um, so features, here we can see we've got an ARIA role of presentation, um, which is sort of weird because this looks like navigation. So I'm thinking even though, uh, so this is an example of an accessibility, an automated accessibility test where even though it's calling this out as a good thing, it doesn't mean it's the right thing. Um, so there, it's important to sort of manually review uh, these things and not just totally rely on an automated tool. Um, but I believe the ARIA role there should be navigation. Um, and there is a link in the slide that gives a list of what all of those possible ARIA roles are. Uh, structured elements. We're going to dig into this a little bit later. And this is so super important to, uh, to SEO and also super important um, visually, super important also to screen readers because it helps organize content. And this is basically just showing uh, you've got one H1 on the page. Excellent. You should only have one. Uh, but it looks like it's providing quality child care in Hartford, um, which is a little bit of an odd H1. On a home page, I would want to see uh, probably this Green Mountain Children's Center is the H1. And then on subsequent pages, uh, the H1 would be whatever the page title was. Rebecca, you may disagree with me on that. Uh, I kind of would. Could it, it, Does your tool have the ability just to click into another page so we could look to see how the headers are used on a non-home page? Because I think that that yeah. might make more sense to people as we walk through them. Because the home page one, especially when they're widgetized, can be really funky with headers. Okay. Headers. Okay, so in this one, the H1 there, GMCC Hartford, H2 Program Overview, H2 Latest News, H2. Um, now these are widgetized areas. Um, the H2s look great. Now these, I'm, if this is a WordPress theme, I think WordPress spits out H4s on those titles um, when it should be H3 to keep Correct. things yep. um, in actual order. Anyhow, that's, uh, thank you again, Gwen, for, for being a guinea pig. But this is a great place to start. It gets a little more technical, but it's nice to wet your feet right here where you have um, the ability to dig in and find out what exactly the issues are. Um, here, Oh, here's one I want to point out. <coughs> and I can't remember if I mentioned this earlier, but continue reading. Um, this is like the read more, read more, read more, or the click here. Uh, it's not meaningful link text. It's If you take it completely out of context, it doesn't give you any indication of what will happen or what you will see when you click on that link. And that's an important part of uh, accessibility, but also... I'm guessing link text is pretty important to Google too, anchor text. It is, because the web is made up of content and links, and links help tell Google what content is important and what it should go crawl and what it should present in search. And when people are putting continue reading and click here all over, it makes the job very difficult for the, um, the search engines, without question. Oh, well, Rebecca, for this next part, I'm going to let you take over the screen and show <laughs> Dino Mapper, which Dino Mapper is a, is a great SEO tool, but they also have uh, an accessibility component built in. Um, this is an example of a paid accessibility checker. Uh, so there's, there's some free and there's some paid. Uh, so if you're already using, so I wouldn't go out and buy Dino Mapper just for this, but if you're already paying for Dino Mapper, then definitely take advantage of this. Um, 
Do I need to do anything, Rebecca, or no, can you I already took me? control. So okay, I use, cool. I've used DynoMapper for a while. If you've listened to me on other webinars, um, you know, I, I use it to crawl client websites and prospect websites and get all of their URLs, which I um, use to help scope projects for either SEO or design, and then for creating 301 redirects when we do launches, because clients never know the full scope of what their website has. Um, they'll tell me that they've got 50 you know, pieces of content and really when you crawl the site, there's like 500. And that's just because websites can live for a long time and they can become really messy. So I've always used DynoMapper to be able to help get that information. Well, another thing that I use it for and I use it for with every single website audit I do is I actually go and crawl it for an accessibility. And so DynoMapper is a similar tool to what Carrie was just showing you, although it's gonna give you different information. And I wanna show you just the kind of information that I pull from it um, because it is really valuable for me from um, an audit standpoint and then to be able to give the client information so that they know what they need to have fixed, whether they're doing stuff themselves or they're gonna hand it over to um, a, a, you know, a coder. So on the rebeccagill.com site, um, you know, we just kind of, th I threw up a, a website w w quick one day when um, I bought the domain and I did it over the weekend. And honestly, I've never looked at it from an accessibility standpoint. So when Carrie and I were talking about doing this webinar, I'm like, well, let me go crawl my own site because I, I hate to admit it, but I've never looked at this from an accessibility standpoint because it's not a theme that we, you know, custom designed um, um, for us. So anyways, um, when I go to crawl the site, DinoMapper will just go and literally crawl every single URL on the site, whether it's plugin created, it's from the theme, it's content, whatever. It's crawling everything it can get to um, that would be live on the web. And what it does is it gives me three columns, known problems, so known things we really have to fix, things that could be potentially problems and then, or likely problems and then things that are potentially problems. I always focus clients on these known problems. And when I'm giving this audit, and I just sent one over today to a client, you know, with accessibility and code validation, uh, you know, I tell people that you need to fix what you can, right? This is like parenting. <laughs> I'm not going to, if you pick your battle. So like Carrie said earlier in the webinar, you can't a lot of times fix every little thing, but you want to do what you can because you, you want to make your site better. But don't feel like you see this list. And sometimes this list will have 300 issues on one URL. I don't want to give this to the client and say, you have to fix all those 300 issues or your SEO is worthless. That's not the case. It's pick your battles. I, it's more important to me that my children go to bed with their teeth brushed than clean pajamas, right? That's my battle that I'm going to pick. I do the same thing with accessibility and code validation. I tell clients, here are the ones that are, that are most important. We're going to hit these for sure. And I'd like to see these resolved if we can do that, right? And so think that through when you're looking at these reports. But anyways, because I and I say that because, again, sometimes I have 500 URLs and each individual URL could have like 200 problems. I've literally seen them that bad. So what I love about DinoMapper is it allows me to go and export this information to Excel. So it'll create me a very quick um, spreadsheet of every single URL and it gives me all of this data listed out. I can also come in here and say, well, I'd like to just review this individual URL. And what I would do then is anytime that there's a custom template within the site, I will go and pull this this document and create a PDF for their development team to say, here's all your custom templates. Here's, here's the report for each single template, because this is a great starting point. If you can fix it at the template basis, it will cascade across the site in, you know, in most cases. And so this tells you exactly what's going on. Same information that Carrie had, um, just a different presentation of it. And it makes it very portable for, you know, for, for you to use for yourself or with somebody else. The other cool thing is the visualizer. I can do similar to what Carrie did um, with her tool, although I think this one's a little bit more pretty. Um, it it's gives a lot me, of bit more pretty. Yeah, it gives me all of the issues on the left-hand side, and I can click in here and say, okay, well, there's a red X. What does that mean? Well, it means that the color scheme that we're using isn't complying with those things that Carrie told you earlier with those contrast ratios. And so how would you do to fix it? You'd, you'd, you would need to find, I would have to modify my color scheme or modify this 
this container, I think it's called a container, of to make sure that that is in compliance. Um, and, and good Lord, I have bifocals. I don't know if y'all realize I'm that old to have bifocals. I have bifocal contacts. This kind of stuff's important to me. So I need to make sure that it's also important, you know, to my sites that other people are going to visit. So these are just some of the reasons why I love DinoMapper. DinoMapper has um, a blog with a category dedicated to accessibility. It's important to them. Um, again, this is a paid tool. You don't have to pay for this tool. You could, there's free tools available. But if this is something that you are going to do a lot with audits and you're going to be um, actively engaged with or accessibility is going to be your thing, um, it would be worth you doing it. If you are a developer on this webinar and you're creating templates or custom builds for clients, this is something good for you as well because I check this on client builds that we do with custom builds and I, we do an audit before go live and we you know we fix all of the templates that might have issues um, so just we just wanted to give you a different view of some tools that you can use and this one is my favorite okay so with that said Kiri are you ready for me to throw back controls over to you let's do it all right okay cool uh and I appreciate you saying the the pick your battles part that's uh, very true. So you may be asking yourself, uh, how can I improve my website? Now that I know what some of these issues are and I can see them on the screen and, and uh, some of these that you'll, you'll be able to start identifying without even doing an audit, um, what can you do to, to improve your website? Um, so I like to think of it, we all have different roles, right? Some of us are designers, developers, Maybe we're uh, creating the content, or maybe we're a web consultant, or maybe we are a combination of several of those things. Um, accessibility spans a lot of different areas. Uh, like we were talking about with the headings, it, it matters how you write your content. Uh, for designers, it matters how you uh, color contrast your text and your background. For developers, uh, it matters how you're writing your code. And if you're a consultant, it matters how you're uh, helping your client saying things like, we probably shouldn't use a slider. And here are the bus here's the business case for that. Um, so I wanna just go through a few examples based on uh, what whatever your role is. So if you're a designer, um, here are some resources here, and I'm not gonna sh show them to you, but just put these things on your radar. So designers who want to look at your color contrast. Um, I remember when I first started working with accessibility and finding accessible color palettes, uh, my thought was, oh, I will never be able to have a, an attractive color scheme again. Uh, they're all hideous. And it's not true. You do have to work a little harder to find ones that are good contrast. But that does not mean you can't do beautiful designs. Um, Get rid of tiny fonts. Uh, they may look hipster and cool, but darn, I can't read them. Um, there is a plugin if you're using WordPress, and one of the things that it does is add a little front-end control to your website that lets users manually increase the font, uh, which is really, really super handy. So if you want to display at say 16 pixels or points or whatever, you could still give your users control. Uh, to increase that. By the way, they can do that with their browsers too, um, just as a something, something. So, and then clear and consistent navigation. Like, I know it's boring uh, to always be looking at um, that that top left to right nav, or or maybe in some cases a sidebar nav, um, and you want to get clever and do cool things. But there's a reason why so many websites have those, and that's because it's expected. It's usable um, people know to look for that so uh, be sure your navigation is clear and consistent developers skip links i've got an article there for how to add skip links to your uh, site if you're using a wordpress site uh, keyboard navigation this is an example of poor keyboard navigation um, you can see the tab through is not it jumps around um, so we go from the logo over there to the right, back over to the nav. Um, so you want logical tabbing order. And for you developers, that's uh, you can control that with the tab index. 
Uh, and then also those ARIA roles that we talked about earlier. Rebecca, yes. I know you'd love to talk about HTML5, so I'm gonna I let do. you. This, this is a pet peeve of mine. And the reason it's a pet peeve of mine is because I'm constantly defending it online with people. So HTML5 technically says you can have a bazillion H1s on your website page or post, and it's fine. And while Google won't penalize you for it, which is true, it's not going to, you are not helping Google and you're not helping humans and you're not helping screen readers. And th this is why it's, I find it so frustrating. So semantic HTML5, which we are providing a link for so you can learn more about this, is really important to SEO. And that's because it provides an outline to your content, meaning you have one H1 for a URL. That is the overriding topic in the content. Then you can have one or more H2s. Those are secondary topics. If you've got things you need to highlight underneath them, they are H3s. And then if you even get more granular under that, that is H4s. The, and, but I go and I, I do audits and I have clients who have me optimize their content that they've published and they know is probably not right. And someone on the content team believes that the H4 looks better than the H3 and refuses to use the H3. And what they're doing is when they're when they're when they're making those visual decisions, they are goofing up the structure of the content, which makes it more difficult for Google to understand the nature of that content, what the top the subtopics are within that content, and how it can utilize it in search. It also makes it difficult for um, screen readers and anybody that does have accessibility issues. So as you're using headers and subheaders within your content in your templates please remember HTML5, take the time to look at the URL that we're gonna to provide to SEMrush's um, blog post on the subject. And remember that those subheaders are not because of color or size. They're, the primary usage is to give structure to your content like it's an outline. Um, and again, you know, Google is essentially blind. It needs those indicators so it can help understand the nature of your content. And this is especially true now where Google is having semantic search and it's pulling out pieces of content and it's, you know, it's really utilizing multiple keyword phrases for an individual URL. And it can do that because it understands the semantic makeup of that article and you know the structure of it if you do things right. Um, so so I, I will get off my rant on that, but it's just something that I really, really wanted to make a point of saying. And by the way, if you go and you look at Bing Webmaster Tools or you try to validate your code with the W3 and you are not using proper structure that I've been talking about, they're both gonna come back and say, don't do that. It's bad for humans and it's bad for SEO. So it's just not me rambling about this. The world around me actually believes it too. Um, so, all right, I'm gonna get off my soapbox. <laughs> it's a good soapbox, thank you. Um, okay, so that's some things you can do to develop. And if you are a content creator and you think the H4s look better than the H3, then tell your developer to uh, change that via the CSS. Yes, um, with your designer's approval, of course. Uh, so content creators, if you, if, if your contribution to a website is writing articles, um, then you can use the uh, semantic headings that Rebecca just talked about. You can also provide that alt text for your images um, and then contextual links. I touched on that earlier. Uh, please don't ever use click here, click here to die. Uh, Carrie, can I jump in real, right here real quick please. on your content creators? Because there's, I want to just give a, a, a quick scenario um, of real life. So I am working with a publicly held company. I am basically going through their existing content and updating it, right? And the goal is to optimize it and make content rank better. Now, this this website has a lot of authority with Google. Google will rank a ton of their content and they have a ton of content out there and you've all heard of them before. And so here's the, the interesting thing I've found is I've gone through tons and tons of articles. Um, if I see an article that's not ranking and it just, just seems weird because it's within what they talk about, right? And, and it makes sense and they should be ranking for it. Um, and if that's the case and I go and I, I start to dig into it, 
the number one thing I have found is that the alt text on their images is goofed up and it's basically full of keyword spam because the content creator and the person who was entering in that content thought the more keywords, the better, and they were basically forcing all of that in. And guess what happens? On those articles, every single one that's had this issue, it is at the bottom of search. It's like position 80 when it is should really be you know, page one. And so it makes a huge difference. Um, and so I just wanted to to bring that up because you might be seeing this kind of thing and be going, oh yeah, whatever, I'll text for images. Like really, can it have that much of an impact? Well, I can tell you from the work that I've been doing these last few months, it really does. Um, and it can make or break your ranking on specific pieces of content. It, you're not gonna get penalized from the search engines, but they're definitely going to ignore your content because it looks crappy to them and they don't they don't wanna produce that. Um, for their search, you know, for the, those their consumers. Preach, sister. Well, while while you've got the floor, um, share a little bit about that consultant role, what your job is for accessibility. Okay, so yeah, so so I'm the perfect one for this slide. As a consultant, you know, I go in and I audit after the fact. I teach people how to optimize. Right, I go through existing information, and I'm and I, you know, and I'm teaching them what they've done wrong and how to make it better. This is the things that I'm I, that that matter is that you know I and I keep trying to preach is accessibility matters to both humans and to SEO. It's it's a core part of SEO now. It's not just at the content level. It's also at the developer level. We need to do basic things like review each and every t custom template within the website, whether it's WordPress or it's another, you know, CMS that you're using. You need to look at the entire website to see if um, code might be great, but it might be like that scenario I just gave you, where the content creator is causing havoc and nobody even realizes it. Um, Educate your client on what matters, and it's like things like that slider. There is such a thing as slider blindness. No one is going to look and wait for the slide seven to show up to give them your value proposition. It doesn't happen. You know, people don't want to have your slider going and underneath logos being rotated and then pop out boxes coming at the same time. It's like it's overkill, it's obnoxious. And as a consultant, if you're on here and you're a developer or your configurator, it is your job to educate your clients of that. Go search for slider blindness in quotes on Google. You will find articles that you can give to your clients. Search for articles that show sliders are hampering performance because it drags down the site and you know, and it's it's you know causing much more havoc than they think. And and I don't even see them. I don't, it's like to me, they're ads. You know, I, I, there's a whole time our whole demographic of us that completely just ignores them now. So as your as a consultant, your best role is to find information to give to your client to show them that it's not just you saying it, it's an, another party, specifically somebody of authority greater than you that says this is a bad idea and here's why. That's how you convince the clients to do the right thing. Um, and you know, I will push back as much as I have to to make my clients understand that you know their idea of this cool sparkle glitter dancing pizza on their website might seem really cool to them and their nephew, but really not to the rest of the world. And here's why, and here's the data that that you know supports that claim. Whew. I know, again, so far. <laughs> I'm passionate about these kind of things because you know, when when people come to developers and consultants, they want the, the, you're the professional. They want you to tell yep. them what's the right thing, and you need to remember that and and own that and educate them. And if if they push back on you, you know, give them data. And if they if they lay their foot down and say no, then fine, that's okay. If you're an end user and you own a website on here, you know, the same goes for you. Your consultant or developer is trying to educate you. It's ultimately your site. You can just tell them to pound sand, and you're gonna they're gonna do it your way but let them kind of explain the situation because all of us have the same goal in mind we want to create a positive user experience for the people that are coming to the website we want to that website to be successful we want it to you know show up high in search we want people to have positive user experiences when they get there stay on it and convert and it's a team effort so we just got to work with it as a team and yes I'm passionate about that <laughs> I love it uh, well, when we started the webinar, I said there are two things that I wanted you to walk away with. 
Uh, and that first one is that if it's good for accessibility, it is absolutely good for your SEO. And then the second one is we just piled a ton of information at you. Uh, you don't have to run and implement all of it. Do one thing uh, and you are already making your site more accessible for folks. Um, I've got a slide here with some additional resources. Those uh, WCAG guidelines I mentioned uh, earlier, um, the the level 2A, you can find out more information, what all that includes there. Um, here's some, Rebecca mentioned earlier that Google was pushing out resources on accessibility. Um, that's the link where you can find that. And then here's a, uh, just a collection of resources and tools from someone in the WordPress community, Rachel Cherry, who's a passionate advocate for accessibility uh, and check that out. And then also um, uh, Rebecca mentioned the DinoMapper blog as being a great resource and then that SEM rush article on HTML5. Uh, so Carrie, I'm going to jump in here real quick because uh, I want to make a couple of points on this slide. So the first link, if you are a developer and you are wanting to sell into the enterprise or with any website in academia, you have to understand and be able to adhere to those guidelines. It will be part of your um, request for proposal you receive. It's going to be part of your contract. So first and foremost, that link, know it, understand it, know what's required, know how to deliver it. Um, the second link, which is the accessibility link from Google, a couple of things there. So the Lighthouse app that um, Google or Carrie was showing, that's the Chrome extension, that is a Google piece of um, software that they are pushing. So when you see them reference things on performance and accessibility in there, you know that's what matters to Google because they're pushing that out to developers. Also within Google's accessibility information, there is gonna be information on fonts. Carrie mentioned tiny fonts. Google specifically will tell you what size of font you should have as a minimum and how your fonts should be uh, appearing on mobile devices so they are accessible for all people. Um, so, you know, it, we know it's important to Google if Google is giving us this information and using many different routes to push it at us, right? Super important. And they talk about viewpoints and things like that for mobile responsiveness right within Google Search Console and give you feedback for that. Um, so so th those, those, those links are important. And that very last one is the one that I mentioned. Anybody on here, whether you are a content creator, a designer, a developer, or a consultant, you need to become one with that information and make it part of your practice uh, because it will help everyone that visits your website, whether they be machine-based or human-based, understand your content and uh, you know how it can help them. Well, I was just gonna let y'all off easy and say just do one thing for accessibility, but Rebecca's making you do it all, so all right. <laughs> Get out there. Um, Rebecca, we are pushing up on the hours. I don't know, do we have time for Q&A? Um, we have some, a few minutes, yeah, and we've got like a number of questions. So let's see. Um, when you talk about slider being a bad idea, are you suggesting that any motion, even something like a video clip motion is a bad idea? Um, Carrie, I'll let you answer that, but I, I'll put my two cents in first. So I hate all sliders hate, hate, hate all sliders because they do want me to go into a seizure. I, I can't even have them on the screen if I'm trying to read something because it's so problemsome for me. Um, we know it's bad for performance. We know a lot of people don't pay attention to it. Um, I'm okay with videos that play as long as I get to say they are going to play, right? And, and I get to control that. Um, that. Those are my thoughts. Carrie, what are your thoughts? No, you, you nailed it. There's nothing wrong with motion, uh, but it, it needs to be able to be controlled. Um, there are some like little JavaScripts that mimic like typing on the screen. Um, those things I don't think present an issue, but basically just try not to be annoying. Um, and, and, if, and as long as a user can control it with a pause or play, you should be fine. Okay, so next question is, Teresa would like to know, are there any guidelines for large homepage videos and accessibility? Whew, that's a, I'm thinking you're make, talking about maybe like a background animation or yeah, a video that's so. showing. Um, the, the website that comes to my mind right now is uh, QuickBooks has uh, one, and I honestly don't know off the top of my head um, how that 
if that's acceptable or not. I can tell you as a user, I find it highly distracting uh, to read the text with, with all that going on in the background. Um, and to my knowledge, there is not a way to control, uh, control that. Um, so sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. Okay, so the next question is, does Carrie use Total Validator? Um, I have used it in the past. It's a good, a good tool. Um, it's that web aim is sort of my go-to. Uh, every one of those tools is going to turn up a little bit different results. That's just the nature of them. Um, but certainly use it. Yeah. Okay. So what Stephanie would like to know, what is a better alternative to a read more button or link on an article? Uh, so the, the easiest way from a programmatic standpoint would just be to insert the post title after the read more. So something like read more about post title. Um, and even that provides is at a minimum provides a little bit of context. Or if you've got like a blog page or a category page, most likely the read more is extra. Your link for the post is already a link. Your, your the title post title is already a link, right? And so you've got two links going to the same piece of content, uh, which would be really annoying to me if I was had a screen reader. <laughs> I'm trying to go through that. Um, so you know, so in that case, you really don't even need the button that says read more because you've got the the title being linked already. Yeah, and I will just a, a quick note. There are some um, you can download uh, some screen readers and other assistive technologies or simulators to get a feel for what those are. If you do not have uh, a blind friend or a, a somebody who uses the web differently in your life, go make a friend with that person. Uh, maybe you'll meet them at a meetup or such. But nothing. I there's a, a a friend of mine in the WordPress community that's blind. And I run everything by her. I'm like, okay, I think this is right, but you tell me, is this annoying or not? Uh, and it's great just to have somebody that's actually using a, a, a screen reader and listen to a screen reader uh, because those things talk like a million miles an hour. Even more faster probably than I talk. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the next question says, I'm sorry if I missed this, but what would you recommend if a client likes the concept of a carousel or a slider? So my, I'll let Carrie answer that um, too, but my, my comment would be to them is to encourage them to go with a very nice hero image that's static and that's kind of like a background, right? Give them the ability to change the text with that. Um, to you know to 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 highlight what's going on in their organization at that point in time. Um, I know people like to have logos and sliders. That's fine, or logos and like carousels. That's fine, but let me, the user, control that movement. Give me arrows so I know I can move forward or backwards to see more of things. Don't move it for me automatically. That that's my opinion, Carrie. What do you say? Uh, I, just exactly what you already said. You try to educate your client on what uh, is actually good good for the user. And if they insist on a carousel beyond that, then uh, you know do your best to steer them in the direction of something like Rebecca is talking about. Okay. So the next question: Is there a way to test color contrast? Meaning, if I have a graphic or a web page, is there anything I can run the graphic through or run the web page through that would tell me if the ratio is good enough? Absolutely. There is a website. The link is in the slides. And I'm, I want to say it's like top total. I can't remember the link right now, but it is in the slides where we talk about color contrast. You can actually upload an image uh, and it'll look at that image for you. Um, someone else asked, how do I determine the ratio for contrast? And I think that that would probably be also with the testing tool you just mentioned. It would give you the, the ratio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's other, uh, there's a lot of just Google in color contrast checker. And uh, in addition to the links, and there's some references in the slides to those, but you could just Google it too. Uh, there are a ton of tools. A lot of them are not very pretty. They're fairly utilitarian, uh, but you can pick two colors or even put in your own hex code if you know them, one for a foreground, one for a background, and it'll tell you what the ratio is. Okay, so next question was from Me Melanie. Can we get away with a bold link rather than an underline? Um, from an SEO standpoint, the bold highlight of text is an indicator to the search engines. Now, it used to have a lot of weight before, um, not so much now, but they are still using that 
and it plays into that HTML5, you know, the semantic usage of HTML5. And so I would encourage you to read that document um, that we gave you the link to and consider that when you're asking this question. I think you would look at the question differently. So, if, you know, based on that, I would tell you, no, it's not acceptable to use the bold to highlight a link because A, it doesn't adhere to HTML5 and B, you're making your website visitor think and you don't want them to have to think. You want them to intuitively know that something is a link and that they can click on it and not make them question and test things out. Yep. Anything to add or did I? Oh, you're just add, you're you're doing your own q and I'm just sitting back having a cup of coffee. Okay, uh, I can't <laughs> answer this next one. For form labels, hide with CSS using display none or something else? Display none, exactly. As a matter of fact, WordPress, if you're using WordPress, has a built-in class, and I, I think it's called screen reader text, like screen dash reader dash text. Uh, you might have to Google that just to make sure, but if you add that class to a form label that you, in WordPress, it'll automatically, um, that display none is, is built into WordPress core. Okay, um, so Susanna asked, will you mention use of voice to make websites friendlier? Now that is something that we didn't cover. Do you have any opinion on voice? Um, can you, I'm not sure what I understand. Okay, so we don't understand that question. So Susanna, if you could just pop in a little bit more context to that, that would be great. Um, let's see, I'm looking to see what I have, may not have covered. Okay, slightly different question, sorry to re-ask. Video backgrounds in general, not carousels, should be no better or worse than a com complex image, but yeah, or yay or nay to them as a design option. And do alt texts apply the same way as they do to static images? Uh, great question. So you do not need an alt text uh, because that's considered a decorative image versus, uh, you know, a meaning or an image that's providing meaning or context to the page. Um, as far as the yay or nay, I'm going to have to do some research and get back on whether or not that passes muster uh, from an accessibility standpoint. Okay, so next question is from Liam. Follow up to alt tag, tag descriptions. We have a portfolio site that shows our work for specific clients. We've alt tagged using minimal keywords that identify the client project rather than simply literally describing the image content. At what point does weight accessibility versus appearing in search refer reference that client? Um, Rebecca, you can probably help me out on this one, but my, well, it doesn't have to be a literal representation of what the image is like this is the client's logo um, again pretend you don't have eyes and you're trying to uh, you know what meaning does that convey uh, now from a search and SEO perspective my guess is that as long as that alt text is relevant to the content it's linking through to um, then you're then you're fine but I don't Rebecca anything to add on that yeah so you know, you want it to be descriptive so that Google understands what the image is that you're showing inside your portfolio and, you know, kind of how it connects with the other content on that page. That's from an SEO standpoint. Um, but you have to balance that with accessibility to make sure that the way that you're phrasing things isn't going to be um, altering or hampering the accessibility of, um, you know, the, the words that you're using and, and describing that image. Um, and, and I would think of it this way. So, and this is another real world example that I'm going through with right now. I have an SEO client who's a plastic surgeon. They have a lot of before and after pictures. They had an SEO company that was maintaining their site and was update, uploading all the images for them. Every single image. So like you go to before and after for um, like, ba basically it was like the pages about fixing bad, really bad um, breast augmentation surgeries, right? They just have gone bad. And it shows you it shows you what it was before, which is post-surgery to what the new surgery created. So you could really see the difference of, you had a botched surgery from someone who didn't know what they did, but you're not stuck with it. There's help you can get fixed, right? That's, that's the message of this page and the intent. Well, everything that was uploaded was complete numbers. <laughs> Every single image had numbers. Now, granted, 
because of HIPAA and you can't give out client names. I get that, right? But if you're Google and you come to that page and all you see is those images and all those images have numbers, it doesn't give you any opportunity to understand what that image is about, right? Or, or even what that page is about. Google can't figure out anything about that page and know how to either use that page in search or pick out images and use those in Google image search. And so from an SEO standpoint, when you're creating those alt descriptions, and I told this to the client, I'm like, I don't even want you to update those images until we get through keyword research together because I want you to see what actual people humans search for so you can look at those search phrases and go, okay, now I understand what the world searches for that may or may not tie to my medical you know, terminology. Now how can I best describe these images for people so that, you know, so that they understand what it is they're looking for, what went wrong, you know, what was the fix? And then, you know, and because that adheres to both accessibility and to SEO. It is a balance act. And you never go and veer towards good SEO to compromise usability or accessibility. And so that's where I would, you know, I would tell you if there if you have to draw a line, draw it there. If what you're trying to do for SEO is going to compromise the user experience or create accessibility issues for people who do use screen readers, then don't do it. That's your answer, because ultimately it won't be good for SEO. Drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we have covered all of the questions and I'll scan through them again, uh, just to make sure that we did. Um, I, I just do want to thank everybody and particularly Carrie for joining me today for the webinar on accessibility. Uh, there, you will receive an email that comes out with a, a copy of the recording and I will have it on the YouTube channel so it's available at any time for you. And then um, the slides again were in this little handout and if you're, if you're watching this video after the fact, those slides are also available on SlideShare. Uh, just look for my name and you'll be able to find them. Uh, any parting words, Carrie, for us? Uh, no, just appreciate you guys tuning in. And now you know, you can't unknow what you know. So you're responsible uh, to some degree for helping make the web a more accessible place and spread the word. All right. Thanks so much, everyone.